last year, um, I took on the effectiveness of airfoils in the loose fire. I had a theory driven by my perpetual laziness <laughs> that airfoils in loose fires were actually rather ineffective because, you know, my dad and I would spend hours sanding airfoils, and of course I would do kind of a, a bounded job. And I would notice no difference in, in our time depending on how well or how poorly our airfoils so, I actually I kind of wanted to put that to the scientific test, just to see what happened. So that turned into my uh, research and development project for last year, and that's my data table from last year, taken right from the various PowerPoints. Um, essentially, what, what I did, and I'll give you the, the layout in short, is I took um, I took a very simple B-boost glider design, not, nothing special, no, no real bells and whistles. Um, and it was my intention to be able to fly them actually uh, with you know, real rocket motors. Unfortunately, Colorado uh, decided that it wasn't going to rain for about like, three months, so we were fired them. So I ended up hand flying them. As you can see my results, and I think the graph does a better job uh, demonstrating this, is essentially what I found was Actually, my test is that an airfoil glider, which is expressed as glider 3, the, the purple uh, bars, is that uh, they're actually less, con is that they're actually, while they are more consistent, um, they are actually, as a whole, on average, and both in total tests, less effective. And, and so that, that was very interesting to me, uh, and I felt that was validated. However, I so I drew the conclusions that, due to Bernoulli's principle, and I'll get into that uh, in a couple minutes, uh, that rocket boost gliders, they move so slow in the air when they're actually gliding down from a rocket boost that they simply can't take a, a full advantage, or really any advantage, uh, of any of the other forces and principles at work. And I also drew the conclusion that, that simply based on kind of subjective observation by myself, uh, I, I think I built about three different prototypes of gliders. How, how vastly different they perform, just based on, on just building differently. And, and even that into last year, we've seen that. Um, so, so I was quite happy with that as a year's work, but I ran into some different criticisms and some different challenges that I wanted to meet, and I got second, and red is my least favorite color, so I wanted to try and uh, redo that and try to amend. <laughs> Some of the um, some of the criticisms that I got. So um, before I do that, I just want to get into a little bit, as I mentioned, of kind of the, the forces that are at work. Just some basic background on kind of what an airfoil is and how it works. So this is essentially Bernoulli's equation. I will spare you the variables and such. Uh, and essentially, just kind of this is as a framework. This is the much more interesting picture. Uh, essentially, you know, I'm sure some of you are familiar. Uh, the reason you build an airfoil is because you want air moving faster over the top of the wing than on the bottom of the wing because you create low pressure over the wing and when there's a pressure differential you create lift. The thing is, and I'm going to go back to that, is uh, when, you have, uh, when you have so many variables uh, dictated by speed uh, and how big of an effect, uh, you know, even just playing around with one one at a different speed functions, you get vastly different results, which kind of validates, again, what I looked at earlier. So, as to the improvements I made in my overall uh, design, it was my first intention, again, to actually be able to fly these as a rocket knife. still want to get to that, um, but, again, it doesn't rain in Colorado, so, I, I don't know why it doesn't. So, uh, I built a wind tunnel. This was actually a project, and unfortunately, I don't have access to the Air Force Academy. So I had to build a tunnel. Um, I actually I did this before without any knowledge of what I was ever going to use this for. I built it as a school project with uh, two other classmates, and this is just kind of the preliminary designing in our uh, engineering lab. But essentially, we have two funnels uh, that are like the picture on the left. Um, that essentially they again take advantage of Bernoulli's principle and they funnel the air to the chamber, which, you have to, which is on the right. So, in the testing, pretty simple. I actually I built the exact same prototype 
uh, as the gliders I made last year. Uh, again, it's perpetual laziness. I wasn't going to reinvent the wheel. Uh, and also, I wanted more consistent results to be able co to compare it to. Two, only two major changes I made. Number one, I made carbon fiber boosters for um, longevity. And the second was, uh, on the last one, I had, on last year's tests, I had made three gliders, one with no airflow, one with very simple airflow, and one with the actually professional airflow that I got from QCR. Uh, this year, I eliminated the middle one uh, simply because I wanted just to get the extreme, the no airflow, and the other extreme, the really well done airflow to try to exaggerate those results uh, to get the real effect of an airflow on boost glider. So, uh, that took, so an afternoon of testing and rebuilding the wind tunnel because someone broke it. Uh, I got my data. The data on the left uh, shows the angles. I tested it at five, at four rather, angles of attack, flat, five degrees, 15 degrees, and 25 degrees down, uh, with again the no airflow glider and the airflow glider. Uh, the reason the numbers are in range is because it's a homemade wind tunnel. It's not uh, exactly scientific. Size. However, I think the range is still, you get a very good uh, idea of the forces are at work. The, uh, the numbers on the right that you see, uh, the reason there are only one number now is because uh, I averaged these two numbers just to get a kind of more refined result. So you have uh, each of the raw numbers a difference, so the no airfall subtracted, uh, the airfall subtracted from the no airfall layer. Then I have uh, the same four benchmarks, total average standard deviation and range that I took from my last year's test. So just to put that in a graph. Uh, and what you see is you see kind of a very interesting pattern develop in that when you have a flat, when you have a flat glider traveling at a flat angle, uh, again, as I saw, you really get no difference. And in fact, the uh, airflow actually seemed to perform a little bit worse. However, as your angle of attack increases, uh, first of all, unsurprisingly, you get a, uh, a you get a decrease in resistance. And by the way, the uh, resistance is in grams. I forgot to mention that. Uh, but also, you see that the airflow begins to take a bigger and bigger advantage until the 25 degree. So, this is something very interesting that I uh, wanted to just bring up. However, uh, and. One, and I'll go into the specific, one of the criticisms I got last year is that, is that you know, my, my hand-flown results were, could, could have been rather inconsistent just because of some of the, of the natural, you know, human variables. Things like, you know, difference in the way I flew the gliders, you know, minute differences in wind and air pressure just because of the exact location, exact time, and temperature I was flying. And, and so, I think that the, the reason I had to go with, an, with a wind tunnel is, is a bit of a blessing in disguise because you kind of eliminate that variable and you kind of get to see the inconsistent with the consistent and kind of put those together. But one of the things that, that I will bring up personally is that we're all human and when we're flying the boost glider in a competition, the, wet, the conditions are constantly changing. and so. One of the things I just want to point out as kind of a grain of salt to these results is that they are per is that they are pretty much perfect conditions. They are the identical conditions every time, and that's something that I don't necessarily feel um, is accurate to a real boost light flight. Whereas uh, the last year's results were much closer to that. Another interesting thing and this this actually occurred to me when I was writing my RIC report is on the left you see kind of kind of the forces at work in a real glider flight. When you have a glider, obviously depicted by this very stupid looking airplane, when you have a flat glider moving, uh, obviously you have the equivalent opposite reaction of the air resistance uh, because of Newton's third law pushing directly against uh, both the nose and the wind of the aircraft. You also have wind, which pretty much moves straight and it can move in either you know, four directions. When you're moving down, you still pretty much have that equal and opposite reaction because the airplane is going down or going up in any case. You have that equal and opposite reaction forcing right up against it. You do have wind to an extent, but in a, in a real glider flight, usually wind is a bit less of a concern, right? Just wanted to let to put it in. When you have a wind tunnel, and particularly the wind tunnel I made, 
when you're flying it a straight ahead, you still get that same equal and opposite reaction simulated by the wind moving. But when you place it at such a raw, at such a low <coughs> angle, you really just have wind moving against the top of the wing, which isn't necessarily the most accurate as opposed to a real wire flight. But again, I think it kind of, when you can compare these results across what normal conditions are and what perfect conditions would be, I think you kind of get a more accurate depiction of, of kind of the conclusion that I'm trying to draw. Just another uh, quick point I want to make is that uh, the wind tunnel, I think was, uh, I did to about double, I did, it was 12 feet per second, which is double what you usually, what I would say you usually have on a descending glider in flight on average. So again, you kind of have, again, going back to that speed principle, you have a, a doubled um, effect in, in, um, in speed, which again kind of exaggerates these results, which I, I believe is why you see this airfoil becoming more and more effective. And there we go. Uh, this is the comparison to the uh, results as last year. On the bottom, you have last year's results. On the top, you have this year's results. And I think the, I think the most important thing to derive from this, and I, I can analyze these numbers in hundreds of different ways, and I can take all night. I think what, what the important thing, particularly to the bottom results, are, are the numbers are, are so close. And even the numbers of the, on, the, uh, on the top, but, uh, standard deviation obviously is exaggerated just because the numbers are so big. But when you get into percentages, there isn't a huge difference, even in these double speeds. And so I, I think that the important thing, and again, getting back to my perpetual laziness, is that just an airfoil is just simply in the totem pole of things that you have to focus on when you're building a boost fighter. Airfoil is very low down the totem pole. When you, when I was doing subject, just kind of subjective observations, I uh, found that that's that simply just building three different sets of gliders made such a huge difference because, and again, I could spend all night picking out the, the little, you know, the little details and just building different gliders made, and what a difference that made. And so it, it is really kind of impossible, and I think I've done the best job that anyone can do under these circumstances, is you still really see that, that there's no really discernible effect. So just to kind of summarize, I think as I saw with, with my results, isolated is this year. In close circumstances, in exaggerated wind conditions to what we usually see, and really kind of perfected professional airfoils, undoubtedly an airfoil, and I should read and airfoil, not and airfoil, uh, can make a really big and noticeable difference when you're trying to win a loose flight event. However, and I made this conclusion last year, when, when you're a human just, you know, building, we are imperfect, just building imperfect gliders with little different, you know, differences flying in vastly different kinds of conditions, it just doesn't matter. Um, so, with that, I think I'll take some questions. As I'm not repeating. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm maybe a little unclear, but I'm, I'm kind of seeing that like either or, either you're flying a well-made airfoil or you're flying a flat plate. Yeah. Uh, have you given some thought to, I, I'm not sure it needs to be either or, have you given some thought even just to rounding the leading edges for drag reduction? Well, that, that was what I did last year. Okay. Is, and, and I think the, the thing with with just drag reduction is is I want to get to the bottom of an airfoil and the principles in an airfoil at work. And drag reduction is something that, I, that I'm very interested in, but I think that that's a different, that's a different test. Okay. I want to get to the bottom of the airfoil. Okay, you were controlling it out. All right, now, now I get you. Okay. Thank you, Brad. Uh, in your report, we didn't make any reference to standard deviation for the mean, but on this last chart here, I saw you have a model there for standard deviation for the mean. Okay. So my question is, is uh, your, your, your data, the data points aren't really vastly different from one another. No. And, your, and your, your, the number of data points aren't that great. 
So did you do a standard deviation? Uh, did you compute standard deviation to determine whether or not the differences was in the noise? You know, but I, I think that's kind of the real the real key of my. I think that's kind of you're getting to the kind of the focal point of what I'm trying to say here is that when it, when it comes down to whether we have to kind of suss out whether these differences are in noise, I think you kind of get to the root of my point is that is that well, what difference did the airflow make? Because if the airflow was really truly effective, noise or not, we I would still have clear cut results. So if the, so if the standard deviation demonstrated that you were in the noise, that would be proof of your theory. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Good. That's fine. So uh, the the premise of your theory is is that. You're going too slow with the glider. Yes. So did you, uh, but you're in your air, your, your, that's a very important premise. Yes. And yet it looks like your, your uh, wind tunnel only took you, you only have one speed. Yes. You didn't have multiple speeds. Did you get that any thought to sort of prove uh, your point more thoroughly by varying the speed and watching the airflow get better? I'll give you the honest answer. I don't have the resources at this time with the test. You don't have the Air Force Academy. I don't have the Air Force Academy. You don't have $10,000 a week. No, it is, it is a very, very good point, and it's something I would absolutely like to do, yeah. but given the time I had, given what I had, it, it simply couldn't be done. Okay, so that's the we'll honest answer. Next year with a I, I hope that next year, legitimately, that you know I can test greater speeds, but, you know. Yeah, that's, that's very good to see. I think that's... Are you going to have any kind of demonstration? I hope that? I win a, a, a rock platter tomorrow. That's it. <laughs> oh, you're going to have a rocket? No, I, I, I was going to say, with no airfoil, you're going to compete. <laughs> I don't have a part of science. He kills himself all together. Oh, uh, the great assault graphic. Yeah. Uh, that bothered me when I was reading it. And I, I, I wasn't sure. It's a little bird on the side. So is the purpose of this just to show that a wind tunnel is I, not is imperfect? I well? just I just wanted to demonstrate that you know I wanted to be honest in my results and not you know try to just prove my theory, and I wanted to be honest in saying that, that this is an imperfection in my testing. Right. Thank you. Can your wind tunnel tell the difference between lift and drag? Is it a single dome? Is it the, I'm sorry. What and drag? Between lift and lift no. forces and drag forces. No. Serious. You're doing almost all uh, basically negative angle attack. Yes. So now if you do positive angle attack, even with a flat plate creates a lift. Yeah. Which is kind of why they fly in the first place. Right. And again, it's it's a resource thing. You know, it's just you know. There's also uh, boost layers, you know, boost space, which is much higher velocity. Yes. And that's a place where, you know, particularly with the V square term. That extra velocity is going to make a difference. That, that is exactly something that I think can only be sussed out with flying boost gliders. And it, it's something that I, that I absolutely considered and absolutely wanted to do. It's, you know, just things happen in the real world. And I, I can see two things that could, you could potentially uh, balance with that. One is an airfoil uh, would be lower drag, but you also would be generating. Yeah. 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 First of all, very brave presenting to this hostile crowd because we all <laughs> cherish our, our standing time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, love your presentation. I Thank love you. the fear. I love. I, I, I love the science of it. Um, where I'm challenging you a little bit is. You're taking it into the practical uh, a little bit by talking about the totem pole. Uh, totem pole. Um, that all that sanding just doesn't. It, you don't do it just for lift. You also do it for strength and versus weight. And you're you're sanding off. For example, let me give you an example. You could take an eight uh, piece of balsa and sand off half of it, uh, thick in the middle as it gets the wingtips thinner. Um, and towards obviously towards the end of the and it seems to me like that would be a lot stronger than a one sixteenth uh, plank, which would be probably shred city on, on boost. Can can you talk to that as you as you start to take this to a practical application? Well, it, it is that that is a very good point. Is that there there are other clear is that there are simply other benefits than just the principles of an airfoil. Um, that was, I think, clearly you could tell that was my focus, was kind of the, the principles of an airfoil on the way down. But I, I think that you 
brought up a good point that I didn't make, and I will make it now, in that there is that there are definitely other benefits to an to a to an airport. Putting it all together, is it a is putting it all together, is it a noticeable difference? Again, something that you know wasn't done here and something that I like to do down the road. I tend to partially agree with you that the Reynolds numbers of these airplanes are so high that the airflow doesn't make that much of a difference, although I have examples that show otherwise, but they're, they're special. But I wonder, uh, have you determined in your testing how much of the improvement comes from not the, so much the airfoil, but simply the reduction in drag? Well, again, I, and I think that's kind of, you know, on, on, you know, on one hand, I do want to separate the principles on, on kind of like what makes an airfoil tick. On the other, you know, on the other hand, I do want to make it kind of as practical as possible so that you can really tie it. You know, I'm not just doing this, you know, for a presentation. I want to use, I intend to, you know, take this information and use it practically. So, again, not, not something that I could, could work out, but I, I think it's something that kind of, eventually I'd like to put it all together, you know, put all the factors together, but... And basically, could a modeler gain 90% of the advantage of an airfoil simply by rounding the front edge and shaving the trailing edge just a little bit? Yeah, and again, going back to my very first results, when I did do that, I didn't notice a huge difference. Mm. So, not something I did this year. Can you go back to your data from your wind tunnel test results? Yeah, is that good? Yeah, uh, yeah the, the, first, the first one. Yeah, that. Okay. Could you uh, explain? I'm, I'm not seeing what those that data means. Is that uh, grams? That is or? that is the resistance in grams that I was getting. Um, the way the wind tunnel works is that the the, the the wind blows against. You kind of have that um, little stick thingy, scientific term. <laughs> and then that through levers <laughs> pushes against the scale, so the, you get kind of the resistance. Uh -huh. in on the scale. So obviously the lower the numbers, the less resistance and the more effective that is. Okay. All right. We've got to cut it off there for time for purposes of time. Thank you very much. That